Condoms off. There was a time in my life as a, a rock and roll disc jockey, I, I was playing your songs every third song. You might have been the biggest band in the world at one point, am I correct? Why can't uh, a rock group sell records to an Elton John fan or a Michael Jackson fan or whatever without losing your original market? Uh, it's just good rock music that we'd like to appeal to everybody. The mountains of Holland, as Joe said. Probably the best audience of this tour and I got this Led Zeppelin T-shirt at Taz Records, yeah. Fantastic. It's a little local record store, so that means I'm local. Bowling and just the hair and the image, and it was, you know, he really was, in my eyes, the, the, the grandfather of the glam rock movement. If Mutt's listening, I'm sorry for giving you a mouthful. <laughs> I was actually born five minutes' walk from here. Mm. I've got a theory. Yeah. What? Just give half of what you have to somebody you don't like. All right, so I have uh, Patrick Pentland here, uh, one of the key uh, vocalists, uh, songwriters, uh, musicians with Sloan. And uh, so we're going to talk about uh, Sloan, his music, uh, Def Leppard, yeah. and uh, kind of uh, some of those connections and things like that. So first of all, Patrick, I want to say thank you for, uh, for coming on here and chatting with me tonight. Oh, I'm happy to be here. Are you, uh, where are you right now? I'm in my house in Toronto. Very good. So how are you making out with uh, with COVID and uh, uh, you know, the, the lockdowns and all that kind of stuff? I mean, like like everybody, I suppose. I, I got vaccinated uh, what, like, uh, maybe two or three weeks ago. And um, I'm just kind of waiting around like everybody else. <laughs> I, I, um, I know the feeling. Great for you. So my vaccination is not till Friday, so tomorrow. Uh, right for, the, yeah. for people that are going to be listening, it's uh, a day or two from whenever you hear this. But right, yeah. yeah. So good for you. Well, we'll see. I mean, <laughs> so far so good. But uh, no, I don't know. I mean, I've been busy trying to keep busy with uh, doing like uh, solo acoustic shows online, which I had never done before, and um, and I and I have a Patreon account that I I try to stay active in, uh, if not every day every few days and then um and i have a six-year-old who's right now at at home uh for school because it's you know locked down right now in toronto or maybe in all of ontario i don't know so uh so that's going on too so you know and then i have two other kids who are also in school and they're around as well so it's busy you know i'm always just playing music and making music you know at home very good so i've heard some rumors uh, that Sloan is perhaps possibly working on a new album. Any um, uh, any truth to those rumors? Yeah, uh, well, we started to do some stuff last fall, and um, and then it, I mean, I think we were talking about it. I don't remember what we were talking about, but uh, it just seemed like the inevitable thing is either we'll do a, a you know, we, we we were in the middle of touring our Navy Blues reissue. And so, and then we kind of did, we ended uh, a leg of the tour in March or maybe the end of February of 2020. And so um, the plan was to go back out and do more shows for the rest of the year, like maybe do summer shows. And we were supposed to do this, uh, this sort of nineties tour, I guess, with like other bands who were big in the nineties, yeah, so, cool. which is not something we would normally do, but it just seemed like, well, it's something new to do, something different to do. Maybe play to people who, have, who don't come to see us that often. And we often do festivals where we play with bands like that all the time, too. So it just seemed like that could be a good thing to do. So that was on the horizon. And then everything sort of, it seemed like we would be doing that tour maybe this early this year. And now it's been moved to later this year. But um, uh, oh, I forget what we we're talking about. But oh, about the new record, right? And so yeah. it was like... Uh, so yeah, so we so because of the the lockdown, we're just sort of sitting around. It's like, well, what else are we going to do? We've all because four of us write. There's always lots of music around, lots of ideas, and so it just seemed like, well, let's let's just see what we're going to do if we do another record or not. But then, because of various lockdown situations, and because it's not there's 
four of us in the band at least that would be recording, if not Gregory too, and then and then Ryan has it would be recording it, uh, which and so everybody's a little bit nervous about being around each other or not, depending on who you're talking to. So it all just Christmas hit, and we we're just like, let's just wait and see what happens, you know. So, so are, is uh, the rest of your bandmates? Are they still based in uh, sort of the greater Toronto area? Or? Everybody, everybody's downtown Toronto. Yeah, we're like I live. Yeah, we all live within like a half hour walk of each other, basically. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> But we never ever walk to each other's houses. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the nice thing about COVID is it gives everybody a break to sort of go do their own thing, spend time with their families. That's and, the nice thing. Yeah, yeah and you get that's to probably what that's probably what they planned when they invented the whole thing. But yeah, no, I know it is. You're right. I was thinking about that today because I was thinking about maybe about this podcast or so. I was thinking about the record and that we potentially might or might not be making and. Uh, and I was just sort of thinking, you know, like I haven't seen those guys really uh, in person. We had a meeting last summer. Chris was here at some point in the fall, I think, because we were we I posted some stuff on Instagram of us. We were writing at the time, so I guess we were. I guess the cat was kind of out of the bag then. But um, and then uh, uh, it's just been. Uh, uh, once again, I've lost track of what I was saying. <laughs> you're talking about uh spending uh time with chris in the fall that's right that's right sorry because sorry. Sorry. we're talking about yeah i'm tying them all together so we were uh yeah getting together to sort of deal with the potentially doing this record as but it, it does mean that um it, it has meant that uh some of us have not been wanting to get together at all which makes it tougher to make a record you know <laughs> so as i said we're just sort of waiting to see when people get vaccinated if everybody starts to feel a little bit more relaxed uh, I don't think we're going to be doing summer shows again, which we were, you know, maybe depending on a little bit. I'm hoping that this tour will happen in the fall. But for all I know, it's been canceled. I don't know. But I, I'm hoping not. I think it would be fun to to go out with a bunch of bands from years ago that are still, I assume, some of them are active. Well, from a fan's perspective, if I can just inter interject, I think it's actually really cool because it gives you value for money. So oh, it's yeah. kind of cool when you get to see more than one band on a bill. So if you get to see two or three or four bands on a bill, you know, it's a great night out for either yourself or, you know, uh, yeah. your girlfriend or boyfriend or spouse or friends or whatever. Well, so. also for us, when we tour, we tend to not have an opening act and we just do a really long night because we have so many songs to do. But this would mean that we would probably be playing maybe an hour uh, because, you know, the, the show, and depending on where we would be, probably the people playing last will get, shafted a little bit because <laughs> there'll be a curfew anyway it doesn't matter but um no i th i think that that will be fun and if that doesn't happen then we'll definitely be doing something in, if we can in the fall as soon as we can tour i think we'll be touring well the good news is is that uh and i don't want to go i don't want to spend too much time but the good news is that uh the vaccine rollout is really starting to pick up steam now across canada in the last couple of weeks Mm -hmm. And so, you know, uh, that probably means that by the time we get to the fall, things should more or less kind of be kind of back to normal. So hopefully, I finger, know. fingers crossed. Sure. We'll see what happens. But yeah, I mean, it ha as I said, it has been interesting, though, to be able to because then you can't if you can't tour, which is kind of what we do, then it is also how we make a living. So it's sort of like, well, if I can't, uh, there was a combination of uh discovering a new way to try to generate some income and then playing the solo shows or rehearsing for those was a little bit like playing shows anyway so it's like we have taken a break from each other as i was saying as we started to say uh and it's been i was thinking you know it's been kind of nice to to just step away from the day in day out of the band and because there's always some sort of if it's not plans or we're touring then there's some kind of drama or something going on and so uh i haven't really talked to them that much i mean there's a there's like a group text that goes on between the band and crew guys and stuff that i'm i'm on but i hadn't been for a long time but i am so it's nice to see that people are still as it's nice to see that people think that they're still as funny as they used to think they are but anyway <laughs> so let me just uh let me rewind this whole thing to many many years ago okay and uh so there's a, a young boy named Patrick. He leaves Northern Ireland. Okay. Uh, he arrives in Canada in okay. Halifax. And uh, 
is in Halifax for a short period of time, eventually ends up somewhere in the Caribbean, if I'm not mistaken. Jamaica, yeah. Okay, yeah. Jamaica. All right, there we go. And uh, your family and, and obviously yourself at that age, you spend a, 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 a small window of time in Jamaica, and then you return back to Halifax. That's right. So age, you're about, what, 10 years old Basically, uh, in uh, Halifax? Yeah, like I kind of feel that, because we moved from Northern Ireland. We were only in Canada for a little bit. And then we moved to Jamaica for about the same amount of time. And then we moved back. So by the time we moved back and sort of settled where I ended up growing up, I was about 10. So yeah. And then, um, and so then uh, about 12 years later, I was in Sloan. But, uh, um, but yes, that's that up to that point. Yeah. Up to 10, I was 10. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So uh, so tell me, so you're, you're 10 years old at that point. I'm guessing at that point, you're probably really getting into music as a lot of kids are discovering, you know, the turntable for the first time. They're discovering yep. bands. So tell me just uh, just a quick little synopsis of um, sort of your connection with Def Leppard as, as this kid growing up. And I know you've talked about uh, high and dry and uh, like pyromania. I just, I admit, yeah, those yeah. would, those would have been the records. Like pyromania was obviously the record that kind of, that really blew. I, I, I mean, I guess high and dry had bringing on the harp heart. Yeah. I mean, it had to let it go. Bring it on the heartbreak. That's right. Yeah. But then bring it on the heartbreak was put back on. That's right. When pyromania, pyromania. kicked the doors open, then py uh, bring it on the heartbreak sort of went back into heavy rotation. Yeah, and they had done a video for, for that, obviously. And so yeah, that's right. MTV and Much Music would have been playing that as well. But I just remember getting Pyro. It was just a big deal. I mean, they had that image with the Union Jack, everything, and it shorts and everything. And and uh, it, um, it also kind of like, I feel that, because the other British hard rock that I would have been listening to around that time would have been Maiden or ACDC or whatever, like that type of thing. So... Def Leppard were a little bit more pop even then like and of course working with Mutt Lang and those the, the crazy harmonies and I mean you know it it was uh I I just remember being struck by the by the harmonies even when I first heard it which I would have been in grade I would have been in middle school when I heard that probably grade nine which would be the end of middle school I think well I'm glad you mentioned the harmonies because that leads to uh a, another question I had mm -hmm. and that's that with Sloan uh, one of the unique things about your band, which uh, not to the extent that Def Leppard is, but they have done it on occasion. Uh, basically, every member of your band is a lead singer whenever they, mm -hmm. they want to be for a particular song in a live set list or on an album or whatever. Yeah. So um, as a kid, like hearing those harmonies of the five members of Def Leppard sort of really focusing on their vocals, is that something that subconsciously uh you would have taken in as a kid like from them and other bands and kind of incorporated that into sort of what sloan eventually did around its I, live vocals in I, gigs and that kind of thing i don't know i mean yes i guess but uh yeah i probably would have been I, certainly they would have been jumping up they would have been influenced by something like queen for instance which obviously we would have been too and obviously beatles and stuff but uh yeah. Speaking of queen there you go yeah exactly so so you know but i think that i mean it's also you got to remember the time because that was when hard rock was becoming really big in the Un united states it, you know i don't know if i don't know if the us festival was kind of like the beginning of that but van halen 80, 1984 came out and Motley Crue was huge or whatever. And Def Leppard was maybe just slightly before that, but like, uh, and also you got to remember I'm in Halifax, Nova Scotia when this is happening, which we had TV and radio too, but like things probably got to us a little bit later, but, um, but we did have a really good, the other coincidence too, which shows the value of radio, I guess, is that still today, but is that we had a really good, hard rock radio station that had just started up just around then. Q104. Q104, the rock of the Atlantic. And I'm in so, Halifax, by the way. Right uh, okay. And uh, so that meant that they were playing. I mean, they really did play 
uh, depending on the time of day, but like you would definitely hear Def Leppard or you would have heard ACDC, you would have heard a lot of classic rock as well. But the, these weren't, they weren't classic rock at the time, but so you would still hear newer stuff as well. And they would present bands all the time. So I saw a lot of hard rock or a few hard rock bands anyway presented by them. But um, well, that actually, I'm glad you mentioned Q104 because that sort of leads me into another question mm -hmm. um, or a, a question slash statement, I guess. Um, when I listen to Q104, it's really cool now because they'll play, uh, let's say, like um, a Led Zeppelin song, yeah. and then they'll throw a Def Leppard song in, and then they'll throw a Sloan song in. Mm -hmm. So how does that make you feel as a member of Sloan where you might be driving in your car and without sort of seeking out your music intentionally, because I'm sure you, you have enough of hearing your own music, Mm -hmm. uh, if you're flipping through the radio and suddenly you hear Sloan sandwiched in between, you know, a Def Leppard and a U2 or an In Excess or... Well, uh, I mean, uh, it's cool. That is something that we had been... I mean, if you're talking about, like, classic rock, because, you know, there's different formats of radio. And so right. part of our story was that we didn't really have any radio presence through the kind of heyday of our career really until until our four, until navy blues so the, the other records we got played a bit on cfny which became the edge uh and and college radio but it wasn't until our fourth record that we got played on radio at all and then it was hard to get us played like halifax q four wouldn't play us for a long time like they wouldn't play underwhelmed or anything it was a this well, you, you, you'll be happy to know that the q plays at least Sloan, I'd say twice a day. Every well, that, yeah, and I mean that, but you know, it changed. I mean, I'm talking like 1992, or 1993, yeah. when they went. But anyway, um, but I now, but then, yeah, we sort of realized a while ago that, like, because classic radio, I think there's like a the criteria is that a song is supposed to be at least 20 years old, and so a lot of our songs now are. I mean, obviously, Underwhelmed would be in Money City and all those. So they qualify to be played on hard rock. So we, we were always sort of, we own our publishing for pretty much all of our records. And so that was in some ways, our retirement plan was that we own our publishing and we'll get played on classic rock radio forever, at least in Canada. And, um, but then Spotify happened and then now nobody pays royalties for things and they don't, it's a real problem. So uh, owning your publishing, is not as valuable now as we thought it would be but yeah i think we can blame napster for all of that unfortunately i mean it created well, this climate where nobody wanted to pay for for music yeah uh, well it also exposed the idea that people didn't realize that it's that something that is so interwoven into your life is not something that you can just like i don't think people understand or or at that time understood that the, their favorite songs actually belong to somebody. They were actually written by somebody. You can't, you don't own those songs. They do. And you can listen to them, but it's hard to explain that or to even, uh, yeah, you'd have to have a, a lot of diagrams or something. So I just remember uh, also the idea that, um, that it, it sort of exposed maybe or showed people that not everybody that puts records out make money so or are successful and i just remember watch uh, watching some news report about napster file sharing and they were basically saying well why can't they like why do they need to get paid for that they're rich already and it was like who are you talking about there's millions of records to put out every year so but that was in my mind kind of it it it, it was an easy way for people to steal music it undervalued it <clears throat> showed that record companies were charging way too much because the record industry is insanely corrupt and stupid because where are they and uh and it meant that there was this it, i think it really put artists or songwriters as well as publishing companies and records on alert to realize wait i think that's why like maybe he didn't realize but like lars ulrich and who, whoever it was behind yeah. that his q prime or whatever were were or whoever were, were basically like this is this will have bigger a bigger impact than you think it will. It's not just a bunch of rock stars complaining because they're not getting another billion dollars. If you like, you can't just steal things. And so, and you know, it, it, it did expose the over the, um, <clears throat> the industry, uh, 
you know, a CD, a song, if a CD is $22 and you've got 10 songs on it, well, the song's not worth $2. So I think that Napster's fair enough, but then I think iTunes kind of help iTunes and that type of thing and Amazon or whatever, or not Amazon. Yeah. Amazon, uh, leveled the playing field a little bit because they, cause then, you know, file sharing really went down when apps or sorry, when iTunes started offering a dollar a song or 99 cents a song and people just, I don't think most people mind paying. They just didn't, you know, and also I Napster and that stuff was also when people were transitioning their music from CDs and records to digital anyway. Well, yeah, but I mean, Patrick, to be, I mean, to be, to be honest with you, I mean, it, the system still stinks because yeah. you're, you're a musician and you know this better than anybody that even things like iTunes or uh, Spotify, I mean, they pay nothing for it's it's very little that, that well, a musician makes off of each of those downloads. It, well, it depends because for most musicians, as I say, they don't own their publishing and they don't own their records, so they're yeah. The so ones, they just get a little cut. Of, yeah, the, and so there's two pro, There's two things with that. One is a lot of record deals. When I was signing record deals, and even up to probably the, recently, didn't really deal with digital rights, and so didn't deal with streaming. Like that wasn't a thing. And so we have, we've done record deals that are probably still applying to some records like action pack. Maybe Sony probably still has all the rights to exploit that, but we wouldn't see any money from that record because anyway, like, so the problem that therefore is labels are the ones who can decide how much their, their shareholders to Spotify and their share. They decide how much money gets to the, to the bands. So if they're not getting any money and they want all the money, cause they always take all the money anyway, then the bands are going to get even less. So, uh, you know, it used to be that it, even if a band had a platinum record, that would really become a, maybe a million dollars in their pocket. But usually to sell a million records in the States costs more than a million dollars to do. So they wouldn't see any money for that. But the record company from record one sold would make about $8 a record. So if you sold if every platinum record that a band or sorry, every million dollars a band would make, the label's making like eight million dollars, regardless of whether the band's recouped or not. It doesn't matter. They By the still... way, sorry, yeah, no, I, uh, I, I, I get what you're saying. So mm -hmm. just that when you mentioned Q Prime, um, yeah. So it, and specifically to this point that you're making, uh, so with, with Def Leppard, actually, uh, mm -hmm. Q Prime was their their management. I was wondering about that when I said it. Yeah. Yeah, so it's funny you mention that. And uh, when Def Leppard signed their record deal with, at that time, it was called Polygram, mm -hmm. uh, which obviously is owned by Universal now. Uh, yeah, we were around when that happened, yeah. Yeah, so, but uh, when they signed that record deal uh, 40 years ago, whatever it's been now, uh, they actually had a digital clause. Really? That they, yeah. So uh, in Def Leppard's case, their music wasn't available on Spotify or mm -hmm. iTunes for the longest period of time. Yeah. And then um, because to your point, they because they had that digital clause, they controlled that. Uh -huh. So the record label said, well, we want to put this on there. And the band said, no, 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 hold on a minute. Yeah. We have this clause that gives us control over this. Therefore, you know, we want to work out some sort of a compensation right. deal. Yeah, I think so. I, I'm sure that's how it worked with ACDC as well. Like all of a sudden they were on. There was a big deal. I'm sure they said, "We want more than point zero 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 six cents a stream." Yeah. Well, <laughs> and, Q Prime is really, you know, for for any sort of criticism p people may have about Q Prime, they really, when you look at the roster of artists that they had for the longest period of time, they really did go out of their way to look after. Oh yeah, well I mean, and. Uh, if you look at, I mean, their their most famous maybe is Metallica, and if you look at that band, I mean, Metallica and they're very smart. Or I don't know if they were smart. I think they were, but or if Q Prime was, but they they they're just they had such a they just understood that they didn't necessarily that they needed to own as much as they could or be in control of. Uh, so they'll pay for things as opposed to letting the label pay for it or whatever. That's what we do too. We always record our own records with our own money, so that except for one or two, um, and. So a little bit like Rush, who are also Q Prime yeah, now. Too. I, I think they. Well, I don't. Well, they. I I, they were until. Yeah, but I think mm. that they were involved too. Even if, even if they still had their Canadian management, I'm not sure. But anyway, uh, they're another example. And a, and a 
an influence for us in terms of uh, business behavior in that, that rush we're also very tight with owning things and you know anthem and like licensing and and those are things that a lot of artists a lot of bands don't understand and luckily we had a manager to his credit chip sutherland who who uh educated us on these things and so whether it was i mean it, you know it was his it was his idea to that we should try to own things when you can afford to and um and and we've always sort of moved forward with that. And I think that in that way, as I said, we were sort of hoping that that would be a, a great retirement package for us. And it might be, but right now everything needs to be reorganized, I think, a little bit to figure out how that's going to happen because I don't see Spotify disappearing. So I want to I want to share a story with you that's a Sloan Def Leppard story. Mm hmm so uh many many years ago before i was married or had children or you know starting out in life i was working in a call center okay and in this call center i had access to phone numbers and i had a phone number for mutt lang so for people watching this mutt lang is a a famous music producer mm -hmm. and i knew that <laughs> you guys in Sloan had left Halifax and were living in Toronto and I didn't I wanted to get you guys the cell phone number from Mod Lang because every time I heard Sloan's music yeah I heard great music that I loved and I was one of these frustrated fans and I kept saying to myself Sloan should be as big as Def Leppard they got big harmonies they write great rock songs they have a great live show Mm -hmm. And uh, which member of the band is it whose parents live in Bedford or oh, did live in Bedford? My parents. My parents. Okay. I called your your parents. Oh, really? And I spoke to your mom. <laughs> so this would have been like 20, about 20, 21 years ago. Okay. And your mom answered the phone and I said, uh, I said, you don't know who I am. I said I'm a big fan of your your son's band, and I, I I have a phone number that I'd like for you to give him. Really? So I think she thought, and I can understand why. Like a stranger's phoning here. Yeah. Um, and uh, and I she probably had no idea who Mutt Lang was, and so I said I have a a phone number for a guy here named Mutt Lang. Yeah. And uh, she, she was very polite. She said, okay, well, you know, thank you very much for that. And just kind of hung up the phone. Yeah. You know, for 20 years, I've often wondered if... If I ever got Mutt Lang's phone If you phone ever got Mutt Lang's phone number. Uh, You're going to yeah. tell me no, you didn't. I didn't get it, but, but I'm trying to make up some joke about she couldn't forgive him for, for those about to rock or something. I, but no, but I uh, she's not a fan. But I... Um, <laughs> I love for those about the rock, but so anyway, do I, by the way, I like it better than back and back. Anyway, I don't want to so get, do my, I. I don't want to get my all pissed off, but also his ex-wife, uh, is Canadian. And we like, uh, Tania Twain, right. And she was part of Q prime as well, actually. Well, sh we presented her with a Juno the year we won a Juno. I think, uh, she was up for one and we were presenting and we, pre I think we presented her with the Juno. I th yeah, yeah, it was her. And she's nice. Whatever. I mean, we didn't say much to her, but anyway, we knew that connection. That might have been around the same time, actually. And we knew, obviously, the Mutt Lang connection there. We didn't bother to pull that thread then. So I don't know. If, <laughs> I wouldn't be cold calling anybody, you know, Mutt if, Lang. If I had a DeLorean with a flux capacitor on it, mm. I'd, I'd go back to that moment in time and I'd personally call Mutt myself and say, I need you to call somebody. But if, anyway, I mean, if he was in Canada at any point listening to the radio or seeing TV, he might have heard us um, because we definitely like I know a few t like I remember somebody pointing out that or talking about how his kiss were in Vancouver making a record as everybody is. And Gene Simmons had mentioned us in some radio uh, interview that he liked us or at that time I'd been listening to us among other people or something. And uh, those things are always kind of nice to hear but um so yeah. uh one, one of the things that uh you may not know is that uh, joe elliott the lead singer of death mm -hmm. he's actually a, a big sloan fan uh, i've and, heard that uh, yeah two of his favorite sloan songs are 
uh, the day will be mine mm -hmm. from your last album, uh, 12. And for mm -hmm. those of you listening, go buy the album. It's definitely worth it. It's amazing. And he's also, uh, uh his, his next favorite song, I believe is, um, Oh, from Navy blues, uh, uh, with the, 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 the siren, the horn, um, um money city maniacs. Yeah. Money city yeah. maniacs. Thank you. Yeah. So He's actually played Sloan uh, on his radio show in the UK. Uh, I've heard a that. number of times. Yeah. yeah. And he's made little comments about the band on the show. I haven't positive I have, comments. Yeah, no, oh, I uh I haven't heard I haven't heard anything uh specifically, but I have somebody people have told me that, which is really nice. We did we played with them a few years ago with Cheap Trick, I think. And uh but I don't remember I think I had to leave before they went on or something. I can't remember what happened, but um but uh, I kind of wanted to meet Vivian Campbell. Because, Vivian Campbell from Northern he's, Ireland. He's from Belfast, I think, and so so am I. So, I, but I don't think I did. I think it was a situation where it was just I, from what I from what I heard. I think they were all arriving in separate golf carts or something, and there was a lot of security around. I don't. Remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, we played a show one time with uh, Stone Temple Pilots, like in St. Catharines or something, or Hamilton, I think it was. And uh, it was outside in like a town square and we played. And then right before they came on, it was like just like four tour buses pulled up and then four guys got it. One guy got out of each bus and went on stage and played and they got off and they just drove away. <laughs> they were like in Hamilton or something. So speaking of Vivian Campbell, I'm just curious. Mm. So w when uh, Def Leppard founding member, or uh, co-founding member, Steve Clark, so he died in 19... 1990 or mm -hmm. 19, yeah, 19, 1991 uh, or something. Yeah. Uh, so obviously Vivian Campbell from Belfast, your hometown, uh, stepped into those big shoes. Yeah. How hard, how, like from your perspective as a musician that's in an established band that has a following and an audience, how hard is it? Uh, and not that you guys are still the original four, obviously, but. You know, how difficult would it be for someone like a Vivian Campbell to have stepped into those shoes where he was filling in? Well, I mean, that's so known and recognized. I, t I mean, who, I don't know, because if they knew him, I don't know the story. If they knew him already, then it might be fine. But uh, was he playing with White Snake before that? Yeah. So he was playing with Coverdale. Coverdale. And, uh, right. With White Snake or? Yeah. Anyway. And, yeah, then, with, with, uh, yeah, which, and before that, he was with Dio. Yeah, right? so he did those first uh, three albums with Dio. He he actually co-wrote uh, all of that stuff with Ronnie right. James Dio. So Dio laid down the lyrics, and Viv came up with the riffs and, uh, mm -hmm. so, and all that kind of stuff. I, he obviously was a known guy, and maybe they. But I like Gregory McDonald plays keyboards with us and sings, and now he plays guitar sometimes. And he's he's not a member of the band, but he's all he's with us all the time and. Uh, he kind of the he, but the, the answer basically, which maybe they would find, and a lot of people is that you have to find the right person to fit in, and uh, and you can't always find the perfect person to fit in. But and that goes with for us because we're a smaller organization. That goes for road crew and stuff as well. Like you, you can't tour with somebody who, uh, for whatever reason, isn't get isn't working isn't working out so yeah it would suck to hire a, an actual guy and make a big deal of it and then like two years or three years later it's like we can't handle this guy's gotta go like luckily he seemed to work out yeah it worked out because uh what is it now uh, 30 years oh, later he's still uh, with the band so i mean i was thinking about these guys too and it's like first of all you like there's no way we would work with mutt lang because hi highway to hell and bond's gone and then they, and these, guys, Clark from these guys work on SD Clark and and then their drummer loses his arm and these guys keep going. It's like just stop for a second. <laughs> you know, you're all dropping dead or getting hit by cars, like or whatever, crash cars. But it's you know, there's a yeah, it's it, that must be that's a tougher question. That's a bigger thing, is if one of us had passed away, would we keep going? And and like those guys are Metallica again, Metallica. Uh, and ACDC, whatever, like they're on the, they're back on the road within weeks, I think, right? And uh, maybe, maybe not with Vivian Campbell, I don't know, but like, I don't know, I don't know how we would have handled it. I mean, the thing is, is that Steve Clark was kind of known as a bit of a partier, so yeah. maybe it wasn't a huge surprise. I don't, uh, that sounds mean, I don't know, but 
No, uh, it's, not, it's, I, not, it's not. It's not. Patrick, for the record, I'm 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 glad I've I've and it, I'm not. This is a positive. I know that you've spent a lot of time lately exercising and getting out, and I've heard you jogging and stuff. So I love hearing the fact that you are uh, focusing more on your your health, health. A, little, a little less on the rock and roll. Yeah. Well, I don't know if I'm doing too much. Jog. I'm definitely doing a lot of walking, but no, yes. So, um, yeah, there's there's definitely, and maybe at that time too, like in their career too, because like uh, the impression I get from those guys is a little bit like they kind of started slow in clubs and stuff for a while, but they kind of got pretty quick for them. And so that's probably if you're prone to that type of behavior or, or if you use drugs or alcohol to combat anxiety and stage fright and stuff, which a lot of people do, uh, because you know, every good night's great, but the bad nights are the ones that you still have to get on stage. You still have to perform if you're playing arenas and stuff. And then if you get into that cycle of like, well, I'm hungover, so I'll drink a bit to play the show. Wow, that show was great. Have a few more drinks. Let's go back to the hotel. Yeah, there's a bar there. Then like, oh, fuck, I'm hungover. I got to drink some more. I got to do the show. And eventually it just becomes the way it is. So yeah, I'm sure that they were not, and with Bon Scott, for sure, you know, those people were probably not that. They were like, what are we going to do? I'm not just going to stop because this guy partied himself to death, you know? And so, uh, or whatever. I'm sure they loved the guy. But I'm just saying like, if a member of our band passed away, I'm not sure if we would continue or not, but maybe if there was like, well, if you keep going, you're going to never have to work again and neither will your kids, then maybe I would have to think about that. Also like not, I mean, for them or for anybody, like you put a lot of your life into something. And I mean, I was a little bit miffed at ACDC. I don't know if they heard, but I was a little bit pissed off at Angus for, for continuing on after Malcolm's gone, uh, Phil's gone, Brian's gone. He brought Axel in. And then uh, freaking Axel comes in. And although Axel's out of all right, but like, and then Axel comes in with a broken leg. It's like, get off the stage. Like, what are you doing? Go home. Like, what? Everybody's this. Why are you doing this tour? Like, and they did it and it was successful. So, but now, you know, then he quickly brought everybody back into the fold. But, uh, you know, I, I don't know. Uh, now, what's, what are they doing these days? Uh, like, what was the last? I should have looked up Def Leppard. What they've been? I know they're well. It's been a, yeah, so it's been uh, six years. So they put out an album six years ago. And, yeah, uh, I mean they had a tour planned, but co like they had a stadium, a sold out stadium tour. Actually, were they going to uh, be doing like, stuff with other bands? Were not they going to go out with Motley Crue? Or is that yeah? Coming they up? were going to do a, a double header with Crue, but then COVID hit, and just like right. every other band, that uh, put an end to any kind of touring for the last. But they've been going on. 14 yeah hours. but they're going on tour they're not promoting a new record so much it's just touring yeah just yeah. A, a big tour which is yeah. what my thing is and don't do another record because you don't need to unless you want to because they can go out and play for the rest of their lives you know and it's great like that's what that's not the dream but that's kind of what you do is you build up your fan base so that you will have an audience for the rest of your career. Like, is it yeah. fair to say that nobody gets in a band to sit in a recording studio for the rest of their life? Like, you know, people join a rock band because well, they want to share that experience on the stage. I'm assuming. I, I, I don't know. I mean, it depends on why you play music, but uh, definitely for myself, I often say I don't want to tour anymore, and I just want to make records. And then we're in the studio for a while, and I'm like, oh, fuck, I'm so bored. I just want to get and play shows. And now that we haven't been able to play at all there's a lot of my personality and a lot of my, like I've become a lot more loud and egotistical because I don't have that outlet on the stage and a, and an amp and a, and the, the energy of, of, of that and the lifestyle of touring. And obviously I'm not drinking these days, but like I still like touring and I still have fun and I'm not, you know, a nun or whatever. Monk. but uh but uh you know i i miss all of that that's a whole other part of it that that's why bands that's why motley crew potentially would get back together even though they said they wouldn't just because they miss it they want to play with each other play music and play for play for people and it's like of course what a dream what an amazing thing now it's you were talking before about how i came from belfast and if music when i got into music but my father played in in rock bands in northern ireland before we moved to canada as well so it was always sort of as you're saying like joining a band to play live like my father played he they played in show bands which are basically cover bands and they did their own songs as well but 
Um, People so, could make a good living doing that oh, in no, the for UK sure. for a long time. Actually. Yeah, so so he did that. And so in my mind, there, and also just being a fan of, of punk rock, hardcore bands and touring bands. And I mean, I, I was talking, uh, I was doing, I don't know if I did it in this podcast, but I did it in something else where I was talking about Bowie and just like, oh, just different artists and like how they, or Def Leppard, like how they're always kind of on tour, even if they aren't promoting anything. And you don't even know if they're on tour because that like bands don't always super promote their tours. They might just get out and play to their fan base. And so, you know, like Bowie's last tour was one of his most successful or whatever. It made like $50 million. I didn't know he was on tour. I had no idea. Like he was on tour in Europe and stuff and playing arenas in like, you know, Ohio or Iowa or something like that's, that's, he didn't have to tour is my point. My point is he loved playing a lot. I'm just as an example or like Elton John or whatever, like doing, doing Las Vegas, like, sure. He's going to make a lot of money, but he already makes a lot of money. He's doing it because he has to do it. And there is a, there is that whether you're playing in a, in a blues pub every week for open mic night, or you're playing like we do, which is clubs or bigger venues or festivals in front of thousands, depending I always wish that uh, that Bowie had had uh, some more opportunity to to get back together with Mick Ronson. Yeah, uh, before Mick had passed, I think he 30 did. Thirty years ago, I think that they, I think Mick Ronson played with him on the. I think he played with him on a little bit on Serious Moonlight tour, but I think he played with him like the next tour, the next tour. I don't not not mm -hmm. as a main guitar player, but like occasionally playing, like getting up and playing when he was around. So. I don't think they lost contact, but I, I think the other thing with that too is that not ever like whoever you're with, like it's great to be Bowie's guitar player, but after a while you might be like, I don't want to be Bowie's guitar player anymore. <laughs> so, you're looking in a shadow, I guess. Well, just not just that, but also like obviously he he would be somebody who changed his sound a lot, so he wouldn't. But but Mick Ronson's a big influence or an influence on me for sure. Like his his lead playing. He does these cool bends and stuff that he's not a flash guy necessarily, but he, he had really nice feel. And so and that's you know, the other connection you have with Def Leppard. So all the members of Def Leppard are huge. Mick right, Ronson fans. right, right, right. I forgot about and, that. Yeah. And you yeah. can hear it sometimes in some other. Well, they, that's the thing is like the thing that I think was missing for pyromania, but I think they promoted later was their love of, of like glam rock and that era of British rock, which, which I also love. Like it's, you know, like whether it be Slade or whether it would be Bowie or Mott the Hoople or whatever, T-Rex, all that stuff. Like there's a, there's a flamboyance to it. There's like a, but there's like a, yeah, it's an outrageousness to it that is fun. And whether it's what you dress like or how you play the guitar or whatever it is and Def Leppard and like, you know, doing like all those made, like, I don't know how many, I'd love to find out how many tracks they each had to sing of these parts or he, or maybe it's just him. I don't know. But like, you know, like that's a sound and whether they wanted that or whether Mutt Lang made them do that, I don't know. But like that, if I hear pour some sugar on me or die hard, the hunter, even like, you know, they like, they, you know what I mean? Like whatever they're singing, it's these harmonies are, and of course harmonies are, they're just chords. Like they're not that unique. I mean, meaning that they're, you know what the harmony is going to be, but it's yeah. almost the balls of doing it. It's like, we're going to do, I'm going to triple track every vocal and we're going to do four part harmonies. We're going to stack them like crazy. All these guitars, all these synth noises in the background that you don't even know are there. And that's, and it creates a collage of sound, which to me is what rock music is. It's just blending. It is completely appropriation. It's like going from one thing to the other and taking it all and making it a new thing. And, I think that they could look at their Def Leppard could look at their history as definitely uh, leaving a footprint on on British rock or rock in general, and the fact that they would go out in America, for instance, and play big venues. Uh, I mean, they were playing with us in wherever we played with them, Calgary or something like that, and everybody knew every song. So that's all you can hope for, you know. So that's another question I want to ask you as a musician: How does it? How do you feel when you, you step out on stage and you, you sing one of these songs that people like myself and others know, Yeah, and they're singing the words back to you, you know, and they're air guitaring in front of you, and they're kind of almost being a, a, an, a another member of the band in a way. How does that make you feel as someone that's on the stage and you see the crowd um, you well, know, really knowing the music? 
it depends a, a little bit on where you're playing, but um, the the uh, the coolest thing for me was uh, it was our first trip to Japan, and uh, and we got there the night before we were to play, and you know we flew from Halifax, so you had to fly Halifax, Vancouver, Vancouver to Osaka. So get to Osaka, get to the hotel, go out for some dinner with the road crew people from Japan and started drinking beer and when they get these big icy things of beer and everybody got some but nobody wanted there so i just drank all of them and then we got back to the hotel and i was rooming with our manager chip at the time who who is more of a straight laced guy than i am and and so we got to the hotel and he's like we should all go to bed because we've been flying all day and uh you're gonna you're gonna really feel you're gonna be dehydrated whatever i'm like okay yeah yeah you're right let's go back Go back to the hotel and there's all these girls because they knew that we we'd never played Japan before. We didn't know anybody knew who we were in Japan, really. We were coming over because we were sort of like told, oh no, it'll be good. And so, and of course we're gonna go. So we were there and they were like, it was Andrew's birthday and they knew it was Andrew's birthday. So they were like, we're gonna go to this club. We're gonna take you to this club because they're playing your music there and we know it's your birthday. So we, I'm, Andrew's like, okay. And I'm like, okay. And so I go, maybe Chris went and like our sound guy, Brendan at the time was there. I remember and we went and there was lots of shots and whatever. And I ended up hanging out with this American guy that was almost like a Vietnam vet that had never left Japan or something. And it was just fun. And then like I got back and I'm really talking too loud at two in the morning or whatever. And I go and I wake up the next morning and Chip's like, I'm going to go get some breakfast. And I'd never been ever as hungover as I was that day. Like I wake up and we have to play a show in Japan. We've flown to Japan. And also this is for Navy Blues. And so at that time, Chris and Jay, well certainly Chris was very anti not anti-drinking, but like he did he doesn't drink. And he was very boisterous about that at that point. Certainly in the early days he was. So I couldn't be hung over the first show we play in Japan where I, I felt like I wasn't going to be able to play. And so we get to the gig and the gig's at like six or something, which is another problem. And all I should have done was had a drink, but I didn't. So I had a little bit of a tuna sandwich. And the band that was playing before us mm. was a Japanese band. And they're just like strumming playing. And everybody in the whole place is maybe three or 400 people. And they're all sitting down. And it's super quiet. And I'm just like, like I'm in the bathroom beside the stage, like trying not to throw up and stuff. And then I walk out on stage to play. And we start with, she says what she means. And I think we had the tape. I think we had a recording. And so... We just, but everybody's sitting down and I'm just like, oh my God, it's like an hour or something. And I go, wow. And then everybody stood up and just jumped up and down for the whole time, the whole hour or whatever, and sang all the songs, but they didn't know the words properly. It was just phonetic singing. And so that was pretty amazing. That was a situation of like, uh, I mean, I don't think it was an indication that the songs were amazing or anything. I think it was just that they were into us because we were from Canada and cool or whatever, but uh yeah that, that it is cool and it is cool also to write a new song like they will be mine and then have somebody like it and especially somebody like like joe elliott who would be a songwriter and somebody who's written hit songs so that's nice you know it's cool that's that's cooler to hear than it is to see somebody singing your song unless they're in japan and you're hungover but so yeah. Uh, to, to circle this back to, so you're in Halifax. So tell me about Sam, the record man on Barrington street, Sam, the record man became a little bit of a hub for, cause it was sort of the big record store downtown, certainly before, uh, HMV came. So Four floors. Yeah, it was. Yeah. And, uh, I forgot about that. And so Jay worked there and, uh, I think his girlfriend worked there. And then this guy, the guy who was the manager, Mike Greater X, was involved with us at different points. And my girlfriend worked there as well, eventually. So it was a bit of a hub. And it was where you would get, you know, obviously records. There were smaller record stores, too. I never was, I was never a big purchaser of records anyway. I always wanted to spend it on something else if I had it. But, uh, and I also, I played guitar. And so I was like, I just played, make my own music. But, um, but but knowing people who worked at record stores, I would get free stuff all the time. And when I'm, I had a lot of a lot of movies, a lot of VHS movies, because you those were always hanging around. Uh, you know, cheap. I'm surprised you. I'm surprised you didn't have any laser discs. No, no, <laughs> no laser discs. I didn't even. I got a, I got a uh, a DVD player. I didn't even get a DVD player. I got a, a Mac 
Tower G3 or something, and it had a DVD player. So I got the I got Alien, like the Ridley Scott, like at that time, so 99 or something. It would have been like a director's cut or something. And I remember watching that on DVD, and I was just like, this is like amazing. Because it was like a, a computer screen. It was quite wide. It looked great. And now it's like, I'll just watch whatever on my phone. Like, I don't care. <laughs> so one of the reasons I, I, I mentioned Sam the Record Man is that uh, you, you talked about the changing of the recording industry, record labels, bands, yep. you know, how they earn a living, that kind of thing. And uh, as a music fan, I actually I miss Sam the Record Man a lot. And the reason I do is because for a band like a Sloan or uh, the Tea Party or, you know, uh, countless bands quite often – uh, or in many cases, a lot of bands would do a tour uh, at different Sam the Record Man. Locations. Yeah, it was like yeah. they would do the in-store performances that would sort of open them up to a new audience. Like if it's a young band yeah. that's just been signed, oh yeah, as an indie label. And so, do you worry at all, like as an established working musician, do you worry at all that the next generation of of people who want to be rock stars, who want to be musicians, um, that that infrastructure isn't there anymore to help get them the exposure that, that existed? I mean, if, if I don't, you can, uh, I worry about it a little bit. I don't know because you got to remember that certainly an in-store for – I mean, it wouldn't be – you would do an in-store more if you had a lot of backing already, like a label – would set that up you, you know usually you would so that you would probably be a band that was getting attention anyway i think there's i think there's um the in infrastructure now is online it's digital like everything else i don't uh, but i know that sloan did a lot of in stores and we still do actually we did one a couple of years ago in portland but it's always mom and pop type place you know small places now uh but we did a lot of hmvs and a lot of sam's and yeah, and it's also the reason you do those things as a band too is to meet the people who are selling your records, and and they will be the people that, like sometimes they're fans or whatever, but like they're the ones who are the face that at that time were were selling people your record. So yeah, they'll, they'll promote you. I mean, all all anything promote promotionally is good, but also. I don't want to support any bands coming up because I want to do the gigs myself. <laughs> There's too many bands. You know, everybody can record a record in their basement or their bedroom now or on their phone. And then it's all up on Bandcamp or Spotify or whatever. You know, there's no there's no need for labels, really. I mean, Canadian labels are – I mean, I'm getting in trouble because I keep doing these things and shitting all over everybody. But they're, indie Canadian labels are kind of questionable because it's a funding culture, right? So there's a lot of money goes to these smaller labels that's supposed to promote maybe one band and then they'll, but major, all labels do this. doesn't matter if they get funding or not that you spread money around. And so there is support that way in some ways, but the problem I have with that type of thing is that it, then it decentralizes. Like if you got money, say a factor grant to promote a specific band, but then you take that money and just put some into that band, but into this and over here and take some for yourself their money like then you're not building that type of support then you're diluting support like it's fine to try to make everybody the number one band but really you should try to make one or two bands the number one band and so i have an issue with that i think that the labels aren't really built to promote bands so much as they're built to kind of help out a little bit and get a little bit for ourselves and whatever now i'm saying this all not off the record, but I'm not a lawyer. I don't know if this is true necessarily, but well, I, 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 I know it is. But <laughs> Yeah, you know. I, I think what you're saying is true. I mean, just as a music fan, uh, so like speaking like as a fan of Def Leppard and Sloan, uh, like I remember in Sloan's case that when Sloan got signed to a label and there was kind of a push that was happening to try and give you guys that exposure, Yeah, that – multiple other record labels suddenly descended upon Halifax That's right. and said, we need to sign up a thousand other bands just like Sloan. Well, Not that they were, and they, they weren't successful at it, but that was kind of the thinking. It was like, well, Sloan is doing something, so let's go look for bands that sound yeah. like Sloan. Well, yeah, I mean, in Canada, it was worse. See, the Canadian major label industry, at least back then, wasn't really based. First of all, you have to understand that 
like the Canadian music industry would promote at one point was about Canadian bands, but really they became distribution centers for American releases. And it, and then it worked back the other way where we would be working with, uh, we were working with RCA or like uh, Sony BMG and in the States, even though Sony owned RCA, we were with RCA in the States, but they were like, well, you're not directly signed to us. So we're not going to put that much effort into promoting you, even though we were in the system, but because we were a Canadian band, they were the American counterparts weren't as into promoting us because they didn't want to spend the money on us. They wanted to spend it on somebody else. Why would we spend it on you when you're signed to the Canadian version of our label? We're not going to make as much money. So that's an issue, but also, you know, there it's fine that obviously Sloan was fairly successful tea party. You've mentioned we were going to go out with moist and headstones and stuff like that, but labels were fine in promoting those bands, but really those bands and we had to depend on, touring and like nobody's nobody retired off of getting played on the radio like it's it's i mean there's cancon for a reason because if if they didn't have to they wouldn't bother signing or selling canadian records at all they would just sell the first thing that sells which you're talking about sloan and halifax but it's really nirvana and the world and so we got signed in part because of that because that's what a label would do or anybody who wants to try to make as much money off of something as possible the grossest way possible a label will do it so they will go and they will try to sign every single band and nirvana will make geffen i don't know like say a hundred million dollars and then they'll spend a bunch of that money on other bands that won't make them that much money but maybe one of them might be nirvana they didn't know nirvana was going to happen at all they didn't sign nirvana thinking it was going to really sell really it was more because uh, political stuff i guess with dgc and stuff but like they they um in canada it was a, there are some people that we worked with because i really had a, i didn't have a bad time with universal or mca but we when Polly Graham, as you were talking about came into the picture we had been kind of a big wig a big a big concern with navy blues uh up to navy blues with mca um and so we got a lot of attention from them but we weren't signed to mca so when they absorbed polygram suddenly there were all these other bands that had been on polygram that were now on universal that were directly signed to universal so when we put between the bridges out they didn't put as much promotion behind that record because there was i believe i'm maybe this is wrong but like our lady peace maybe came over and maybe matthew good or something so suddenly they had other acts that they had to put their money into because they were actually signed we might have been a better band even but like they they couldn't promote us because we weren't directly signed. so but we had a really good time with Sony. Uh, they were, I felt like they were a little bit more interested in, in, in um, developing bands. And even us at the point we were in our career, which is kind of like, you know, our, our, our real spring chicken days were over. And Sony really put a lot of faith into it. Lisa's a bit new at Sony, put a lot of faith into us. Whereas with MCA Universal, they were fine, but like we, didn't, we never felt looked after so much as we did at Sony. Well, I'm going to I'm, I'm going to ask one last question because I, I want to thank you for your time. You've mm -hmm. been really valuable with this. So just to sort of circle this back into the Def Leppard ethos of it. Of course. How do we get Sloan opening on a stadium tour with Def Leppard all over the United States? I mean, there's got to be a way for us to. You got my email. Twist some arms, and you know, like just you don't have to twist there. any arms. I'll do it. I'll do it in a second. I would love to see Sloan in a stadium. I think we could do no, but we thousand people. It would well, be just we, amazing. We, we've done some of those. We've played with the Stones four times. That's right. We've, we've played with uh, the Police. We played like the second show they played. I think Union show that was a stadium. We've played with uh, Lenny Kravitz. We've done tour. We toured with them, Foo Fighters. Stuff. We can play all these big places. We're very good at audience participation and getting. So yeah, put us the on tour pumping. with those guys. The fist would, You know what? And we're also. <laughs> it sounds lame, but we're not really interested in breaking the states anymore. So we're happy to go on any tour. Like if we go on a tour with Def Leppard, it would be playing to people who are into Def Leppard and have been since they would be people our age, right? Probably and a lot of younger people too. That's great. That's exactly who we want to play to we don't want to play to like 17 18 year olds at all we want to play to people our age or 30s or whatever people who love hard rock music and they're or rock music because we're a rock band even if we might dabble with this or that but when we play live like we're a really good 
live rock band. And so, and also we, we are one-stop shopping because we have a crew. We know we have a bus company. We have everything already ready to go. Like, we don't own, you know what I mean? Like we have every, all our ducks are in a line. All you have to say is meet us at this place on this date and everything's taken care of. Like Sloan in some ways, is it fair to say that Sloan is a uh, sort of a self-contained unit? Yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, obviously we, we don't own everything. Like we don't own tour buses, but we know we have a, our other manager, Mike Nelson, like the, a lot of what you have to do is just a black book kind of thing. Like you just have to know who to call, who's the best sound person to get, what's the this person to call in this town or whatever. And, and so we have all of that. We know we've been touring for 30 years. You know? You're frozen here. So I don't know yeah, what's I've going lost, on. <laughs> I've lost the, the internet signal for some reason. Everything froze up. Okay. There we go. So you were saying you have your manager uh, with the buses. And I'm just saying that there's, there. I'm just saying that like, yeah, we're self-contained. We have, it's just a lot of experience. And then luckily we have respect in the music business too. So we do get to work with people, like the people we work with crew wise are either really good people or people we know, <laughs> but they're usually pretty good anyway. You know, uh, I mean, nobody that does a bad job comes back out on a second tour. <laughs> Well, but that's for anybody. That's for any band, you know. Well, Patrick, I want to thank you for your time. For everyone listening, uh, seek out Sloan online. You can find them on Twitter and Facebook man. and Instagram. The individual band members are there. Check out Patrick's Patreon as well. Yeah, uh, I know you put a lot of content on there. Mm -hmm. and, Always. Yeah. So I'll put the, I'll put this on there when it when it comes up. Oh, great! And yeah. and and just on a side note, with your bandmate Jay Ferguson. Mm -hmm. uh, make sure to say thank you to, to Jay for me. You can say uh, this young boy, Clinton DeVoe, was visiting Sam the Record Man uh, 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jay was working there. And he uh, there was a, a, an autographed Def Leppard poster because the band had visited Sam mm -hmm. on the Hysteria tour. Really? Because they, yeah, so they played Halifax then? Yeah, yeah. They played the Metro Center. Why didn't and, I go? I should yeah, the that. summer of 88. Oh wow! Yeah. But uh, yeah, so Jay gave me the uh, the poster that was up on the wall that had all of the uh, the band member signatures. Mm -hmm. so oh, that's nice. Say, say thank you to Jay for me. I will <laughs> if I ever see him again. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, listen. Thank you for your time. And uh, is there anything else you'd like to say before I uh, I wind this down? Well, just if you are talking to Joe, just say we. I'm a fan, and uh, and uh, we greatly appreciate his support. And uh, we're, he's definitely somebody that we're not embarrassed to have speaking for us. He's, I think he's cool. So that's cool. Yeah. You know, he's a cool guy. That's for sure. Good. Good. All right. Well, listen, I'll uh, thank you for your time. We'll chat again another time. Okay, great. Thanks. Great. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Condoms off. It was a time in my life as a, a rock and roll disc jockey. I, I was playing your songs every third song. You might have been the biggest band in the world at one point. Am I correct? Why can't uh, a rock group sell records to an Elton John fan or a Michael Jackson fan or whatever without losing your original market? Uh, it's just good rock music that we'd like to appeal to everybody. The mountains of Holland, as Joe said. Sorry. Probably the best audience of this tour. And I got this Led Zeppelin T-shirt at Taz Records. Yeah, fantastic. It's a little local record store, so that means I'm local. Bowling and just the hair and the image, and it was, you know, he really was, in my eyes, the the, the grandfather of the glam rock movement. If Mutt's listening, I'm sorry for giving you a mouthful. <laughs> I was actually born five minutes walk from here. Mm. I've got a theory. Yeah. Just give half of what you have to somebody you don't like.